Okay, uh, folks, I appreciate the good uh, good turnout tonight. And uh, the topic this evening is going to be hawk migration and hawk identification. And our presenter this evening is Jennifer Mead. Jennifer is a principal at two different Scott County schools. She's principal at Dungannon Intermediate School and also at Fort Blackmore Primary School. And I believe before she was an administrator, you were a, a biology instructor. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I taught biology and earth science and environmental research at Gate City High School for about 13 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I know she's been involved with the uh, Hawk Watch at uh, Mendota Fire Tower, and, mm -hmm. and she was recommended to me by, by one of our Virginia Master Naturalists, uh, April Addington. So uh, I think you're, you'll all enjoy this presentation tonight. I know I, I've seen a lot of hawks lately. I, I don't, uh, I'm not really good at it, knowing one hawk from another, so I'm hoping after this uh, I'll be a little more, uh, a little better at the identification. So, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for having me tonight, and I do hope you find the presentation enjoyable and beneficial. And I will try to share my screen. And I've got a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Did that work? Can everybody see yes. my screen? Yes. Hawk migration. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, see that well. Okay. And um, I'll just kind of run through it and kind of give you an overview of it. And then we will uh, talk just a little bit about the identification sheet that I sent over so you could have that in your hand. Um, the Mendota Tower has been a uh, one of the official hawk migration sites for the Hawk Migration Association of North America for over 60 years. And Mendota is a old town on the south side of Clinch Mountain in Washington County. And the fire tower is on top of Clinch, um, I guess at the intersection of the Washington Russell County line. And it is an old abandoned fire tower. Um, interesting thing with the tower, each of the legs points to one of the four cardinal compass points in northeast, south, and west. I think this diagram I'm showing you, that is the north leg. And from what I've understood that uh, when the towers were used for fire location and uh, the, the, the cardinal points of the legs helped the identifiers with, with the directions. But um, anyway, at the Mendota Tower, we did not do an official count this year. So if you go to the Hawk Migration site, the HMANA site, there will not be any Mendota data mm -hmm. this year. But there are several other sites. I cannot the hear anything. I smell gas, Mark. It just leaked a second while I was putting the uh, thing in there. Okay. Can you all not hear me? Yes. You can. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. yes we can hear you. Um, okay. I cannot but hear anything. Is are people doing something? Zoom, there's a button to turn your mic. Okay, several of the other sites other than Mendota are having counts this year and getting some pretty good hawk migration numbers, but nothing from Mendota will be reported this year. Um, when we do count at the tower, we have a little system um, with the tower oriented there on top of Clinch Mountain. We look toward the east and as they fly past the tower, that's when we actually do the count. So the, the way the mountain range lies northeast to southwest uh, with the the orientation of the Appalachian Mountains. We, we look east and then we usually work kind of in teams and have some people looking out across the mountain range looking for hawks approaching and then we have counters that actually count as the birds go past the tower and that's how we count the migrants. Early in the day they're usually at eye level or down below and because of the uh, orientation of the, the winds and the positioning of the mountains, we sometimes are actually looking down in the valley onto the, the backs of the hawks rather than up at their bellies. 
and uh, that's always an interesting time of the day. Later in the day, they tend to get a higher altitude, and then later in the afternoon, they drop back down lower to the with a lower altitude and all that has to do with the way the wind the thermals are uplifting them or the uh, prevailing winds rising up over the mountains so it's all in the timing of the day and the amount of heat generated by the sun into the air currents and they uh, tend to glide along this is a small little kittle of broad wings Notice how they've all got their wings outstretched relatively flat to their body. They're not flapping, they're gliding. I always tell the kids, if you were going from Canada to South America, would you rather glide on the wind or flap your wings and expend a lot of energy? So they're, they're looking for good, good thermals and good prevailing winds to carry them along. Here's a, a slightly larger kittle. The term kittle is just like a pot or a kittle that goes onto a stove eye. And I guess it got that term because of the rolling boiling water. The hawks tend to do that. And the kittles form uh, with the thermals or the prevailing winds carrying them upward. And um, sometimes we do see kittles as much as a couple of hundred birds in a group. And we have different people counting. Then we try to get an average or an estimate of, of the number of hawks that were in a particular group. Notice the cloud background that really helps you see the birds, but they all look relatively dark when the cloud background uh, is behind them, but they are much easier to view than when conditions are just crystal clear. It's absolutely brutal viewing conditions. Um, this picture is Mr. Ron Howington. He has been the coordinator of the Mendota Hawk Count for the last four or five years. And he's um, sitting at the top of the little building that's up there looking eastward up, up the mountain range. Um, like I said a minute ago, the Mendota Tyrant has had over 60 years of records for the broad wings and other uh, raptors that migrate through uh, during September. Now, there's other birds that migrate at other times of the year. The red wings, I mean red tails, I'm sorry, the red tails tend to migrate later up into October, but Mendota's really never done a count for the uh, red tails, just for the broad wings here in September. I put on a little bit of data for you. Uh, back in 2010, at the bottom of the chart, we had a total that year of over 200 observation hours and that it has to do with the number of observers you have and the length of the time during the day they're there it's, it's all calculated by observer air and notice that year we had about 8,000 total migrants the next year was a really good year with 10,000 and we still had a, over 200 hours of observation but the last few years if you notice our numbers have been down but so have our observation hours. Um, we don't have as many volunteers to go up and hike up to the Mendota Tower and, and sit there in September to count. Um, but anyway, I think the numbers obviously have a lot to do with the number of observation hours that we do have somebody there. Um, in Mexico, and we'll look at a map in a few minutes and this will make a little more sense to you hopefully at Veracruz there are two sites and if you look last year I, I looked out through the middle of December both of them had over two million migrants go through but they had almost a thousand observation hours that is definitely the place to go to to look at uh, migrating raptors in the fall the uh, Budio birds, and on the handout that I provided for you, if you want to look at the columns, the Budios, if you notice underneath, they have the red tails, the red shoulders, the broad wings, rough legs, and swansons. Around here, probably the red tails, the red shoulders, and the broad wings are the most common ones you're going to see, and the broad wings will commonly be just migrating through. The red tails and red shoulders, they'll hang out here 
during the year. They really don't migrate from this area. But the uh, broad wings are definitely the stars of the September show. This is the peak of their migration. And here is an adult broad wing. Notice it does have a banded tail. The juveniles have no bands on the tail uh, for the broad wings. But this is just a picture of one of the broad wings. And I didn't do this picture. This was one I captured. Okay, our Appalachian Mountains um, provide a great leading line, and that just happens to be a good old hawk term. Hawks tend to follow leading lines, and a leading line would be like a mountain range or uh, maybe a river valley or maybe the uh, coastal intersection with the land and the water. Anywhere that there is going to be good air thermals rising that they can glide on. Um, they would not tend to cross a body of water like the Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico. They would tend to divert around a body of water simply because of food sources and uh, the motion of the, the air. Most of these broad wings are traveling from Canada or other North American locations all the way down into Central and South America to overwinter. And most of them pass through Veracruz, Mexico, as they travel on their migration route. Um, reason being, that provides a great leading line. And when we look at the topography and the geography of North America and Central America in just a few minutes on a map, it will all make sense how all of these factors come into play. Now in the spring, these broad wings will come back, uh, back to their northern feeding and breeding grounds. And from um, tracker, tracking devices that have been put on some broad wings, some of them will fly thousands of miles. And once they get down into Central or South America, while they're there from when they arrive December up and through April until they head back to the north, they may only travel a mile or two a day which is pretty phenomenal considering the number of miles that they've traveled as they've migrated. But uh, there are places, I know over in North Carolina near Asheville, there's a couple of the sites, they put up nets and catch the birds and actually chip them so they can uh, follow them and do research on them. We don't do any of that or we never have at Mendota. Why do they go? Well, their diet for the broad wings is primarily insects small amphibians, small little reptiles. And as uh, autumn and winter arrive, their food sources in the Northern Hemisphere begins to decline. And for them here in mid to late September in North America is the peak. This actually would be the peak week, depending on good weather conditions for the broad wings to be flying through our middle latitudes here. Generally at Mendota, it's somewhere between the 18th to the 22nd or 23rd depending on weather. If we have a storm that backs them up, then that might be a little bit later. Um, and you don't have to go to Mendota necessarily to watch the hawks migrate. Um, I know my mother, she lives right at the southern foot of Clinch Mountain in another part of the county from, uh, well, not, it's not really near the Mendota Tower. And one day last September in uh, 19, I was at her house and I counted over 700 broad wings fly over um, down in the Yuma community, right at the foot of Clinch Mountain. This past Sunday I was there and I counted six bald eagles that flew past, four adults and two juveniles. So you don't necessarily have to go to the Mendota Tower to watch some hawks. You can see them from various places. I know three or four years ago we were chopping our corn silage and my job that day happened to be hooking and unhooking the, the wagons. And I was sitting there in the cornfield waiting to uh, unhook a trailer. And I just looked up and I saw hawks flying over and I thought, hmm, there's no way the counters up at Mendota are seeing these birds today. So it's not just that they follow the top of Clinch Mountain. There's like a wide band throughout the Appalachian Mountains that the birds would follow. So you don't have to go to Mendota just to see broad wings. You might look up in the sky during September and be able to see them from your yard if you happen to be near a good place where thermals would be rising for them. 
These birds go from as far as uh, Canada and the other northern region, northern American regions, all the way into Central and South America. So their migration is thousands of miles. They're following the leading lines. They would avoid a diverting line. A diverting line would be, like I say, across a body of water, across the Great Lakes, across the Gulf of Mexico. They're not going to go across there. They're going to divert around that and pick up leading lines where the air currents are helping them migrate. How do they know when to go? One of the main factors is the photo period. If you just happen to notice, I'm sure all of you have, just in the last two or three weeks, it seems like it's getting dark much, much, much earlier in the evening. So once the photo period starts changing, then that's also um, an indicator for them to know, hey, it's getting time for us to go south. And these birds are definitely birds on a mission. When they do migrate past the tower, they're not just flying and gliding around and flapping around like the locals that happen to live around the area and stay. They are definitely birds that are on a mission. They have those wings set and they are gliding. They look like little planes just gliding down the valley, actually. Okay. Um, the hawks, they really are not like flocking animals because they're the top of the food chain. They're predators, so they're actually competing with each other, but they all just happen to be needing to go in the same direction. Kind of like, I guess, a group of people riding the same subway or riding the same mass transit. Um, I, I tell the kids if the hawks were at a pageant, they probably wouldn't win a congeniality contest. They would not be the friendly birds that would like to flock together. So when you see a kittle or a group migrating, they really are not a flock. So I always emphasize, don't confuse migrating hawks with a flock of birds because they're not gonna flock. Um, mentioned about the kittle, the circling, swirling groups with a vertical orientation, the kittle uh, goes from lower altitude to higher, and the hawks start at the bottom of the kittle, and they actually ride the thermals up. I uh, always remind the, the students, hot air balloons rise, so this heated air rises, and the birds are literally just riding upward with the air currents, and they go to the top of the kittle, and then once they get to the top of the heat, um, they literally just break out. We say they're breaking out of the kittle, and they go in a straight line on, on down the valley. They'll go down, they'll catch another thermal, they'll form another kittle, they'll do the same spiraling upward motion, get to the top of it, break out, go down, catch another kittle. So it's kind of neat the way that physics comes into play here. Got a little diagram to show of the uh, air currents. The first one here, and I guess maybe you can see my, my little mouse moving up and down. This first part of the diagram would show where the solar energy has heated the ground and then that in turn has heated the air and the air tends to rise in the thermals. The other part of the diagram would show how our prevailing weather winds, for lack of a better term, our prevailing westerlies would hit our mountain ranges and then push up the slope, and that would also create the updrafts that the hawks would form a kittle and rise there. So the thermals or the prevailing winds lifting up over the mountain both provides a way that the birds can ride the air with no, no flapping. Here's a better picture of a kittle, a very larger kittle than you've seen. Basically, the hawks are medium-sized birds. They weigh a few ounces, uh, not maybe approximately up to a pound. Their wingspan can be up to 31 to 39 inches. And the length, and that would be from beak to tail, is 13 to 17 inches. So they're not huge birds, but they are uh, more of your medium-sized hawks. The broad wings, they like the deep, heavy forest habitat. They feed on the small reptiles, amphibians, and they like to hunt from uh, trees and perches. The adults have the reddish brown neck and head. They have barred or kind of mottled underparts. And then their adults have the uh, black and white tail bands. 
and their wings have dark edges or dark borders. Hey, Jennifer. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt you, but <clears throat> I wanted to have you go back to that previous picture. And I, I think I know that you estimate, but I just wanted to hear you say it. How do you count a kettle with that many birds in it? How do you count a kettle? Okay. Well, it gets a little tricky to count a kettle like that. Remember I said they go to the top and then they tend to break out. When they break out, that's when we try to get the count. And if we have five or six or seven of us, we try to count silently and then we get an average of, of the, what the group would come up with. But when they're swirling in a kettle like this, it's almost impossible to get a count until they break out. Breaking out of the kettle is the best place to count. Did that clarify your question? Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, here's a map of North America, Central and South America that shows some of the routes. Notice there is a Pacific type flyway, the Rocky Mountains here in the middle part, the Mississippi River Valley and then around the Great Lakes. Notice they really don't go across the lakes, but they would go around them. And then here would be our Appalachian Flyway and then the East Coast. So there's many, many different flyways that all the migrating birds would use. And here again, all of those create good leading lines for them to follow. But if you notice here around the Gulf, it's empty there. They divert around the Gulf, go down along the edge of Mexico, along the coast, and then here's our Veracruz point that I mentioned earlier that it had um, well over two million at each site last year. Some of these birds will stop, hang out around Central America. Some of them fly on down here into South America. And then like I mentioned in um, spring, March, April, they head back, but now they are not on such a mission heading back to the north as they were heading to the south in the fall. So there's really not a major migration. There are some of the hawk count sites that do count in the spring, but it's not a massive migration in the spring like it is in the fall, number-wise. They just scatter out much more. Also, um, here in September, we do see several osprey go through uh, at the Mendota Tower and other hawk count sites, several bald eagles, a few red tails, but like I mentioned, they tend to be later in the year. There's a few coopers, a few sharp shins that go through. Sometimes we've seen double crested cormorants, peregrines, northern harrier, monarch butterflies. Now, uh, we also count those and put them in our data at Mendota when they are migrating. Sometimes we see a few kestrels, few sandhill cranes, few other birds, harriers, uh, goshawks, things like that, but they're, they're relatively uncommon. Um, we mentioned a minute ago the budios, the red tail, the red shoulders, and the broad wing. They're kind of, you could think of those as, I guess, cousins for lack of a better term. They're all in the budio category. The accipiters or sharp shins and coopers. If you look at your little silhouette sheet, you see for the accipiters, they've got fairly wide wings similar to the broad wings, but their tails are much longer and thinner tails. Their tails are actually used more like a rudder to guide and direct them. So they have a little different flight pattern, a little different habitat, and they're uh, build of their wings and their bodies allow them to be a little more agile and a little more, um, I don't really want to say quicker than the Budios in motion, but a little more um, finesse, I guess, because of their, their shape. Then, if you even look at the next little category of hawks on your sheet, the falcons, you notice they've got the pointed little wings and here again, the long tails that are similar to using a rudder. And uh, with the design of their wings, they would be kind of like your, uh, I guess, little runners on the football team, the quick, agile little birds that can just dart around here, there, and yonder, very agile. So each of the hawk types, based upon their silhouettes here, um, 
you can see a different structure for a different function and a different habitat in which they live. They're all designed slightly different that help them uh, be successful in their own little niche of their habitat. Okay, um, on the back side of this sheet, it's always interesting. I always point out to um, the, the folks I do a presentation with, we see lots of vultures at the tower. We don't count them. They're not migrating here in September and they're locals. They hang out. Um, the black vultures have the, the silvery wing tips. They tend to fly with a flatter motion. The turkey vultures, the pink headed ones, notice their wing configuration shows the kind of angular silvery white wing. So that's always a good one. Uh, item to keep in mind when you're looking at vultures. They always look very black and dark and heavy in the sky. The hawks are much more of a golden or a brownish or a tony reddish like color. So their coloration is much, much lighter than the dark, heavy configuration of the uh, feathers on the, the vultures. The, the bald eagles, uh, occasionally we do see golden eagles, um, but we do see several bald eagles migrate through. I really don't know why they don't stop off here because our eagles don't migrate. I'm not sure exactly why the eagles tend to migrate on through our area. Um, osprey, we see several of them, um, fairly easily identified with their wing configuration, either an M or a W. Here at the, the bend in their wings, they have a spot, a very large, very obvious spot if they're low enough, and then the wings tend to be bent in an M or W configuration. Um, back to the front side with your hawks, um, Maryland's and Kestrel's very common to go through here. Uh, Peregrine occasionally, they're just a bigger version, sort of, of the Kestrel or Merlin. Uh, you see their body shape, wing shape is very similar. And then the Coopers and the Sharp Shin are the very common ones. Occasionally a Goshawk, but not very common through here. So um, that's kind of an overview of the Mendota Watch and the um, some facts about the hawk migration and a little bit on the identification. and. Um, I don't know as where you all are in, in you know, your bird identification. I know I kind of have a joke. I say that I have confused, um, I have confused hawks with jet planes and um, with dragonflies. So it's very easy when we're doing the watch to, to miss a hawk or to misidentify it. But um, it's a lot of fun. Even if we do make mistakes, it's okay. And we do mention if there's things that we can't officially and somebody in our group that's observing officially say, yes, I'm, I'm certain that it's a broad wing or I'm certain that it was a goshawk or I'm certain that it was whatever, we do count them as unidentified. Um, so so we, we try to be very honest in our reporting of our data. Um, the Here is the uh, site for the hawk count. You can do... A, hawk count search or you can go to this site and you can see lots of different hawk count sites throughout the country. The data for years back that they have uh, put into the system. So kind of fun to, to check that from time to time or toward the end of the season just to see how many hawks have gone through a particular uh, counting site. And um, in closing, one thing I do want you to make sure you take away from the presentation. This hawk migration for the broad wings, it's a beautiful, beautiful example of how geography and topography, meteorology, astronomy with the, the photo period, physics with the airflow, the air currents, and biology, the survival of the, the birds, how all of this is interlocked and how it all works in unison. And I think that that's such an important concept for all of us to reflect upon how much that different branches of science all can come together in uh, driving this migration so the birds can uh, be successful in survival over the winter and reproduction for the next, the next season. So um, 
So hopefully these broad wings that are flying through now will head back this way, April, March, April, early May, back to their uh, summer grounds and reproduce again to happen all one more year, another cycle. So um, that's all of my PowerPoint and I will figure out how to unshare my screen with some help from Phil here. Stop share, I guess. Yes, yes, that will do, and, there you go. And I'm back, okay. And if anybody has any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. And if I don't know the answer, we'll try to find an answer and I can try to get some information over to you. You did have a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh, Aaron was, okay. uh, had a question about uh, pronunciation. The G Y R. Okay. okay, let's see here. Has it started? Okay, I think everybody. Okay, uh, how do you count a kittle? Okay, when they break out at the top is when we try to get our count. I might be a little off on this, but I think it's a gyre falcon, and I might be off. And if somebody wants to correct me, that would be fine. Gyre falcon. and tell us where that bird chart is again. Um, Phil, do you have the bird chart? Um, you're talking about the handout? Yeah, I, I, I do have that. Uh, okay. Shad, you, sh you should have and gotten an email. That. Mm -hmm. you, yep. sent it, you sent it as an email attachment, I guess, with yes. the Zoom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, okay, and Jennifer, what yes. day coming up would be good for going to the Mendota Tower? I was kind of well, looking For this year's count? Yes. Well, okay. I took a day's vacation and went up Monday to count, and there were four of us there. And one of the gentlemen that was there, uh, George Larkins, has come up for years. Really, really a good birder knows his hogs he said he had come up about seven or eight days here in september and he'd only had about 250 to 300 birds which is way off this year um right now as soon as you could get there weather wise would be the best time for this year and from our discussion on monday with us watching there were like i say four of us there together and all four have watched the Hawks at Mendota for, for several years. They were just not flying. We had a good bald eagle day, but we just did not see many Hawks. I don't know if they have shifted their migration pattern this year, but I would recommend if you want to try to get to Mendota this year, definitely the next few days would be your best opportunity to see any Hawks at all. Mm -hmm. I was looking ahead at the weather. Wouldn't it be better on a sunny day? Yes, yes. The they're not gonna they're not gonna fly on a day like today. Mm -hmm. And the, today so might be a good day to back them up. Yeah. So <laughs> as soon as the weather clears, the first clearing would be the best time you could go for this year. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Is there any way for us to know if someone else is going to be there that might be more knowledgeable? I don't know if George is going to go back up there and be there this year or not. Um, I know he's retired uh, from the Hawkins County school system, Hawkins County, Tennessee, and he may be back some more days. Um, I can try to find out and I could let Phil know and he could maybe pass that on to you guys. I can, I can try to check and see if he's planning to be there any other days. Would you like for me to do that? I would. I would love to go over. Um, okay. We can get a pretty day. <clears throat> okay. And you said it would be better to go maybe mid-morning to afternoon? Yes. Uh-huh. So long as you're up there by about 9.30, 10, 10.30, and stay till, you know, 4 or 5 o'clock, that's usually the best hours, yeah. Some, some evenings, even till 6, if it's a good, typical, good, warm, sunny fall day, maybe even till six, they'd be flying, but that's usually pushing it around here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh, you're welcome. 
Jennifer, are you aware of some of the other counting sites in the region? Where, where would some of those be? Uh, yeah, there's one at Grandfather Mountain. They have a site. Okay. Uh, there's Harvey's Knob. It's up near Roanoke, Harvey's Knob. There is okay. Rockfish Gap up near Waynesboro. And a lot of times what we'll do, we'll check Harvey's Knob and Rockfish Gap and see what's coming through those areas. And that gives us a pretty good idea of what may be headed coming on down the Appalachian Mountain Range. Okay. That is there's one, uh, there's several over around Asheville also. There's some over around Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. Okay. We did one at Cumberland Gap a few years ago. Do they have a count site? I'm not sure Cumberland if that's Gap? an official site or they were or not, but um, we were up there on those, that high point doing, doing a count one day and mm -hmm. uh, all along the Blue Ridge Parkway, I've done some counts at um, Purgatory Overlook, which is just a little bit north of Roanoke. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some of those along the Blue Ridge Parkway, they're really easily accessible. Now, the, the little hike to Mendota Tower, you can drive to the top of the mountain on a pretty good road coming up from the Big Moxon side at Russell County or the Mendota side. It's, it's not a bad drive. But once you get there, you can either hike up a trail, and it's a little rough, pretty rocky. You do some rock climbing, nothing, nothing major, but, but some climbing. <laughs> and then there's the old road that went up to the tower that's rutted out pretty badly. You can't drive there, but you could park at that road. It's just over the top of the mountain on the Mendota side, and you, it, you can hike up that road. It's about a 20-minute, 20 25-minute hike, and it's kind of a steep Kind of a steep pull. I usually take my walking sticks because coming back down it's gravelly and you tend to slip and slide so the walking sticks have prevented a fall or two but it's, it's a good little hike and the view is spectacular even if you don't see hawks the view is just spectacular from the Mendota Tower. A few years ago Chad, uh, Shad and I ended up meeting each other. We were at Birch Knob Tower in um, Clintwood or on the mountain there, Brushy Ridge. And all we saw were vultures that day. Has anyone reported seeing a, a number of uh, hawks from there? I don't think, I'm, I'm not aware of any reporting from that site, but I've wondered like the tower up at High Knob or the tower there, what is it near Clintwood, Birch Knob? Yes. Some of those the ones on. she's talking about, and it's, you know, Pine okay. Mountain is a 120 mile long ridge, so uh -huh. it's perfect for them to glide down. Yes. Um, we, we have seen recently broad wings while we've been out doing our trail work, so we know that the broad wings are, are going down Pine Mountain right now. Uh -huh. And I'm sure any of these mountain ranges in this region, the, the, you know, they'd be similar to Clinch Mountain at the Mendota Tower, so I'm sure there's lots of hawks flying over all of these mountain ranges in our region. Is, you know, I, I know these sites have been established for a long time. Is, is the association, are they looking for more sites? Are they looking, are they pretty much uh, trying to avoid overkill? They've got their sites established and they're not looking to establish more? Or are they well, open I would to think, establishing? I would think they would be open to establishing more. And I would love to see some more established because I tell you, the, well, at Mendota, like you noticed, our observation hours have gone way down. And I think it's because it's such a rough place to get to. Once you drive there, the hike is still rough. And a lot of the people um, just don't want to do that hike. So, uh, you know, I would love to see some more places that are maybe more easily accessible be, you know, noted as, as hawk watch sites. And, you know, if there's anything that we could do to gain some more sites, I would definitely be all for that. Okay. That'd be fun. And I think here in our region, we have a lot of good opportunities. I really do. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I think probably most of us listening can think of a handful that would be, <laughs> be ideal. Right. That Bird Snob Tower is perfect because you can drive right up to the base of the steps. And so unless somebody was just, you know, full on, um, disabled in some way uh, mm -hmm. they should be able to go up the steps and uh, then you've got a 360 degree view 
Right. That'd be that'd be perfect. And another thing too, up at Mendota, um, I've been going up there since about 2009, and um, there's a lot of trees. I know we some of the people that have have observed have cut little trimmings off the trees, but they're beginning to get really high and obstruct their view. I know we were laughing Monday. We said, well, it's the like the Mendota Triangle. We watch them come down the mountain. They go behind this set of trees and then we lose them, you know. So the view up there has become um, not as good as it was several years ago, just from the growth of the trees. Yeah. So any any good vantage places to view would be great, great places. And and like I say, we can try to do what we could do. I, I know uh, Ron Harrington, that the gentleman that was pictured on top of the building with the binoculars, he was the one that has coordinated the Mendota count the last few years. And um, it's gotten a little tough, <clears throat> tough view. So, you know, we could, we can definitely look at maybe some alternative sites for this region. Yeah. Okay. Might be, might be well worth doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Any other questions for, for Jennifer? Have you ever been up to Hawk Mountain? I've not been to Hawk Mountain. Uh -uh. <laughs> That's on might my bucket a, list. <laughs> might be a good retirement trip if I get around right. to doing that. <laughs> I always thought I'd like to go. I haven't made it yet either. <laughs> mm -hmm. It'd be a good place to go. Yeah would be. All right. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, Jennifer, again, thank you very much for, for an excellent presentation. And I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to my ID sheet and, uh, uh, I'm going to keep my eyes open the next few days and, and see what I, what I can see. That's right. Keep an eye to the sky. You never know what's going to be gliding over. Right. <laughs> Do you have any more of those sheets? Um, I up, uh, yeah. The link is actually, I put the link in the, in the chat. So you can, you can go to the chat real quick and uh, the link is there in the chat. Hey, hey, Linda, if you're in Wise the next couple of days, Yes. I have some of these outside at the extension office in a tote. Um, so if you if you go to our office and you go up the wheelchair ramp, I have a tote sitting up at the top of the wheelchair ramp, and it's got a folder in it with a whole stack of these guides in it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks. Bill, you know, that might be a cool thing if we could. Um, um, have some of those for the uh, the Hawk Watch. Do you want to uh, share anything about that for next week? Well, I, I didn't know there's an official one yet. I know we kind of talked about it, um, but as far as a, as a date or anything, but yeah, I've I've still got some printed off. We can definitely make some available. Um, if you've got some some thoughts on a Hawk Watch, just uh, go ahead and mention it to the group. Well, we had talked about uh, doing it sometime early in the week next week. And um, of course, this is somewhat weather dependent, and I'm not sure what the forecast is, but <clears throat> um, maybe on the, the 30th. Uh, uh, you think that would be a, a good day in time, maybe from 10 to 2 or uh, something? Yeah, that, like that's that. a good, good possibility. So uh, where do we want to shoot for? Do we want to try to do that hike in that we talked about, or do we want to try to go to Birch Knob? Let's, let's try out Birch Knob. Um, since that was mentioned as a possible official site, that I might be interesting to, to check it out. Let me... So would we meet at the base of the mountain or where would we meet? 